Awake for the Sake of the Future, Lecture 2 by Rudolf Steiner, The Task of Knowing for Today's Youth, Dawn Act, January the 6th, 1923. It would fill an entire book if I were to compile all the kind words that have been sent to us from those who feel connected with what has been lost in the recent catastrophe. Six days earlier, on New Year's Eve, the first Gertianium was destroyed by fire. Therefore I shall read only the names of the people who have extended their sympathy in writing. We see how deeply this has entered the hearts of those who understand what was sent out to the world from this place. It also shows the deeply felt desire and determination to rebuild and restore what we have lost. It will be a source of strength for many of you to know how widespread our work has become and how deeply our sense of loss is shared by others. For our goals should not be merely theoretical. They should find expression in work, in love towards one another, and in devoted service to humanity. And so we ought to speak here about the deeds we expect to carry out and the tasks we intend to accomplish. I shall mention only the names of persons who are not present, for what fills the hearts of those who have been here in these days of grief-filled gatherings can hardly be expressed in words even though it is felt no less deeply or clearly. So allow me to continue without mentioning the names of dear friends who on this occasion are present even though they too have expressed their condolences in writing. You know who you are. The names were read. We can assume that what we have begun here is already deeply rooted in many hearts. Let us take note that a recent course attracted a larger number of friends from outside this area who also wish to pursue anthroposophic matters here at the Gertianum. Today allow me to turn our attention especially to the young friends who have come to this course to discover for themselves what is meant by anthroposophy and who recently have found their way in such a fine and heartfelt manner to this movement. We must understand what it means when young souls are earnestly striving to grasp what can be known today about science, art and so forth today and also sincerely want to work within the anthroposophic movement. These young friends who are attending this course are among those who came here a short time ago, saw the Gertianum and expected to see the Gertianum again on their return and indeed they thought that they would see it in a different form than is now the case. And when I turn my thoughts preferentially to these younger friends, I do so knowing that those who carry the anthroposophic movement in their heart also carry as an immediate soul concern whatever a particular group or single individual may be experiencing. For the most part, the younger friends who want to find their way into anthroposophic work are searching for what is called today the life of the spirit. In particular, I would like to speak to those who are pursuing the study of academic disciplines, feel an impulse to work together with others and wish to carry out their striving within the anthroposophic movement. Above all these young people are earnestly striving to imbue the human soul with the life of the spirit. Within anthroposophy a life of the spirit is spoken about that which cannot be achieved in any easy manner although today precisely an easy approach appeals to most human beings. We do not try to conceal the fact that the paths to anthroposophy are difficult ones. Anyone who consults anthroposophic literature will also be convinced of this. But the paths are difficult because, on the one hand, they are related to the most profound and potent human values, and on the other hand, they require people to see clearly the signs of cultural decline in our time, and recognise that the anthroposophic movement is trying to move forward along a different path. We must not lose sight of the fact that anthroposophy can be meaningful in many ways for people living in the present age. Approached with inner commitment, anthroposophy can help human beings to perceive spiritual worlds and to convince them that everything conveyed here, out of the spiritual realms, is based on truth. But I must emphasise ever and again that even as important as it is for individuals in the present to take up this earnest, difficult path, nevertheless, those who possess an unprejudiced, healthy human understanding can gain insight into the truth of anthroposophy 
on the basis of their own inner resources and capacities. This has to be emphasised time and again so that no one adopts the unfounded position that only someone who sees clairvoyantly into spiritual realms can perceive what the anthroposophic movement claims to be true. Intellectual life and modern civilization present so many prejudices to human beings today that only with difficulty can we trust healthy human reason. In the light of such prejudices, we are ever less likely to be convinced of the truth of anthroposophy without the aid of clairvoyance. The anthroposophical society should take the lead in sweeping away the prejudices so common in present day civilization. Indeed, it should work against prejudices in all of its endeavours. If the anthroposophical society were to set such an example, then we might be justifiably confident that a human being's inner powers of knowing can grow without clairvoyance. And those individuals who, for whatever reason, cannot strive for the exact clairvoyance that we also will speak about here, still can achieve a full confirmation of the validity of anthroposophic knowledge. There is yet another very special path by which academically orientated young people can find their way to anthroposophy. You see, the study of academic subjects could and should provide the starting point from which young people can arrive at their own intuitive perception of the spiritual legacy of anthroposophy. Let me emphasize that I refer specifically to the human being's self-generated perception. The possibility does exist for science, knowledge and the inner life to be integrated within our educational system. But consider how little university students in our present civilization are inwardly connected to the field of knowledge they are striving to master. It cannot be otherwise today for academic subjects are brought to students as something more or less external to them. They encounter a system that is not at all adapted to express or even to speak of what are often extraordinarily significant aspects of empirical knowledge. Staggering truths, really staggering truths, are inherent today in every field of knowledge, every science or academic subject. And these are truths that, if young people t were to encounter or experience them, would give them a kind of microscope or telescope of the soul. If young people were able to approach these truths through their faculties of soul, they would be able to unlock mighty secrets of existence. The investigations that would lead to enormous discoveries if they were properly cultivated are precisely the ones that would delight the hearts and souls of young people. It would enrich students enormously if they were to find within their academic studies the acknowledgement of the depths of human nature and the individual personality. We have to point out again and again that students living within a system of indifference recognise that the subjects they study are also presented with indifference. As a result, the relationship of students to the many faceted examples of unlocking truths or discovering new knowledge in empirical science remains at a superficial level. I would even say that some, or even the majority, of our university students go through their entire course of study without an inner experience of the academic disciplines they study. They allow the subject matter to wash over them and then, having reviewed sufficiently beforehand, pass the required exams and find a position with which they can make a living. It sounds almost paradoxical to say that the hearts of university students should be addressed in everything that is brought to them. It sounds like a paradox, but it actually could be so. For young people who have a subjective capacity and inclination may respond to a subject out of the depths of their own heart, even though they may encounter something in the driest book or driest lecture and cannot understand the intent of the author or lecturer. Sometimes in such a young person the subject may penetrate the soul deeply. We notice in the best of the young friends who have come into the anthroposophic movement that they themselves are not responsible for this, but rather through their destiny within the life of the present day civilization, they have been offered nothing for the heart out of the current impulse towards knowledge, nor have they received anything for the head. Some of you here will not want to forgive me for saying this, but most of the students who are here will indeed understand it. 
Today we have reached a time in the development of the natural sciences. I try to describe this in the natural science course, in which the students typically have to experience in their study of the natural sciences what I would call a feeling of oppressive weight of paralysis within the soul. Indeed, science today is such that whoever studies it with diligence and discipline experiences something like the anguish that overcomes the soul when you wrestle with the philosophical problem of knowledge. Anyone who looks around at what exists in the sciences today encounters great cosmic questions embedded within the narrow descriptions of phenomena. And these detailed formulations that arise out of the truth of natural science press into the soul the impulse to articulate the riddle that has to be solved. Human beings long to solve these riddles, otherwise we feel an inner paralysis, an oppressive constraint. If only this anguish, this paralysis, could be transformed into a beneficial fruit of our study of the natural sciences. For out of the anguish that grips the entire human being, there could arise not only the longing for the spiritual world, but also the capacity to see into the spiritual world. And so, when the human being has to absorb knowledge in a way that cannot satisfy one's inner being, this experience ignites a powerful impetus within the soul and heart to overcome what is inwardly so unsatisfying. That is what one finds so terrible, so shuttering in the pursuit of knowledge today. No effort whatsoever is made to understand that the current situation can work upon the entire human being in such a way that young people are prevented from reaching up to what is worthiest in humanity. Only young people acting out of their own deep longing are able to free themselves from the hindrances that have been laid in their way. And when we turn from the natural sciences to the humanities, we discover that during this era when the natural sciences have ascended in their influence, the humanities also have been affected by the methods used in the natural sciences. If students could be guided to the humanities in a way that restores a fully human perspective to the humanities, they would experience something that I would like to call an inward soul shortness of breath. For if all of the abstract ideas, the results of documented research and everything else that could be found typically in the study of humanities today were brought with human sympathy to young people, it would produce a kind of soul shortness of breath in the individual. This gasping for breath would awaken the impulse, the necessity to reach higher into fresh air and thus enter the realm of spirit observation that supports an anthroposophic world perspective. Whoever has followed the spirit of my lectures on the development of the natural sciences in the modern period will not be able to say that I have given a superficial critique of modern science. To the contrary, I have tried to demonstrate that the natural sciences, and also the humanities today, are indeed significant cultural foundations. They have served and must continue to serve the basis of civilization that must be laid down and acknowledged so that we can extend these foundations of knowledge further in the future. But the human being cannot be anything other than a human being. In order to fulfil our humanity, each one must be fully body, soul and spirit. Students and young people today live in a time in which they are confronted with matters devoid of a human element. Even so, the noblest and most enlivened human striving could be stirred within them. If only they would receive what is necessary, even if it were not imbued with the fullest humanity in the highest sense of the word. For if young people were offered actual knowledge at the most basic level, something would be achieved. If that were to occur, then our students would need nothing more than to hear about the accomplishments of natural science and the humanities in the places of higher learning. And they would feel not only an urgency to adopt spiritual science, they would also have the capacity to receive it. And then what would live in students and young people would grow entirely out of its own accord, so that anthroposophic knowledge would be the means by which civilization can move forward. If our young friends carefully consider what I have said, paradoxical as it may seem, they will find that I have characterized the most important causes of suffering that they have had to endure during their studies. I believe that the cause of most of these sorrows is also the reason why they have come to us. But the suffering and pain for many of them already has a long history 
and it is not possible that the situation for them as individuals can ever be fully rectified. For something that should have happened in a certain period of one's youth cannot be received in precisely the same form at a later time. What comes later, however, can serve as compensation. Indeed, the compensation for what the young people among us fail to receive at an earlier time is the recognition of the importance of cultivating anthroposophic life in the present. Take upon yourselves this task. Do for the anthroposophic movement what you either already know you carry as a conviction or what you, in the course of time, could do with conviction out of your completely individual and innermost self as something necessary for the continuance of human civilization. Then you will be able to carry and preserve in your hearts this realization even beyond this earthly life. You will be able to sustain the consciousness that you have fulfilled your obligation, your duty to uphold humanity and the world in an era of the greatest human difficulties. This will be a rich compensation for what may have been lost to you at an earlier point in time. If each one of us inwardly experiences and grasps what it means to be part of the younger generation in our time, then we shall be able to understand why young people have found their way into our circles. Moreover, the capacity to build a relationship to these young people will grow and grow amongst those in the anthroposophical society who, shall we say, by virtue of their age, do not appear to belong to the younger generation. I believe that out of our current grief-stricken situation, I can affirm to the students and young people, and say as well to the oldest members of the Anthroposophical Society, that individuals who today rightly understand themselves as human beings can experience within the Anthroposophical Society what must occur if human civilization is to go forward and what will prevent the destructive forces from gaining the upper hand over the dawning of life's quickening forces. In the culture and civilization of the present age, it sounds almost comical to say that because human beings in their spiritual soul nature continue to be active between the time we go to sleep and the time we wake up, we should also take care that our spiritual soul nature conducts itself in the right way during this period of sleep. But within the anthroposophical society, you will discover that the human spiritual soul existence that occurs between going to sleep and waking up is regarded as the seed that we shall carry over into the eternity of the future. Our physical and etheric elements, which are visible to us as we carry out our daily tasks from morning to evening, remain in bed while we are sleeping. We also do not carry our physical and etheric elements within us through the portal of death when we enter the suprasensory spiritual world. We do, however, bring with us into the spiritual world a delicate spiritual essence that exists outside the physical and etheric bodies during the time between going to sleep and waking up. We shall leave aside for the moment the question of the significance of sleep for the human being on earth. Through anthroposophic spiritual science it becomes clear that this essence, this substantiality which is imperceptible to ordinary consciousness, lives between going to sleep and waking up and is precisely what human beings will carry with them when stepping across the portal of death, so that when we exist in worlds other than this earthly one, we can continue to pursue our tasks there. The task that the human being wishes to accomplish between death and rebirth will be achievable insofar as we have cultivated the spiritual soul element during earthly life. My dear friends, just as our physical world surrounds us during earthly life, so too, in the spiritual world, human soul beings exist as a living presence, even though they do not have physical bodies. These soul beings remain in the spiritual world, perhaps decades or centuries, waiting for their next incarnation. They exist in the spiritual world just as we human beings live physically on the earth. What happens here on earth among human beings, we refer to this afterward as historical life, is influenced not only by other earthly human beings, but through the forces exerted by human souls who are living between death and a new birth. These forces exist. Just as we reach out our hands within physical reality, these beings extend their spiritual hands into the immediate present. 
It would be an arid historical account if the only documents we use were ones dealing with our earthly realm. The true history that takes place on earth includes the participation of the spiritual forces arising from the activity of souls in the spiritual world during the time of their existence between death and a new birth. We work together with human beings who are not currently incarnated in an earthly life. We transgress against humanity when we do not educate young people in the right way. We transgress against humanity when we ignore the noblest efforts of human souls to accomplish deeds out of unseen worlds. We transgress against the whole course of human development if we do not nurture our own spirituality and enable it to pass the portal of death fully prepared to continue its development with ever increasing consciousness. For when the spiritual soul nature is not cultivated on earth, then the consciousness which ought to be illuminated immediately after death and ought to grow increasingly throughout the existence between death and a new birth will remain dim. If the human being wishes consciously to reach full human potential, then the spiritual aspect must belong to the whole. In the present age, it should be the earnest endeavour of human beings who understand the intentions of the anthroposophic movement to know that anthroposophy is a cosmic life legacy, a cosmic life potency and force. We transgress in the highest sense when we fail to achieve what must be developed in order for the earth and humanity to progress further. The demise of all that is connected to the earth will occur if cultivating the spiritual is neglected. In addition to our interest as individuals in the insight to spiritual science, many of us are drawn to anthroposophy by the profound earnestness of the task of forming a spiritual connection with a deeply meaningful, all-encompassing opportunity to act on behalf of humanity. This knowledge holds true not just for a particular category of human beings. For example, it is equally valid for the young and the old. But in order for the young and the old to find their way to one another, a unified spirit must be active among all who belong to the anthroposophical society. May the younger people bring their very best. May the older people understand the best offered by the younger people. May understanding be extended from one to the other. Only then shall we move forward together. Let us move beyond the solemn days we have just experienced, beyond the grief that still hovers over us. Let decisions be more than wishes or accolades. Let our decisions penetrate our hearts and reside so deeply within our souls that they become deeds. Even in small circles we shall need to perform deeds if we are to compensate for our great loss. The deeds of the young when they are achieved in the right way will be cosmically significant deeds. The greatest beauty that can be created by an older person will be manifest by working together with human beings who are still capable of accomplishing youthful deeds. If you grasp this, my dear friends, you should be able to meet the younger generation with understanding. Through the beautiful examples offered by the older people to compensate for our loss, the young people will be able to see what will benefit of the future and what will satisfy their own inner well-being. Let each one of us see in one another what is just and imbued with strength. Let strength generate and empower strength. Only then shall we move forward together.